In today's gospel, you have Jesus asking the question, and in a way, it should have been an easy question because the question was already answered in the past. You know, who, who do you say that I am? You know, first he asked who, who the people say that you are. You know, who the people say that I am? And they say, well, you know, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, one of the prophets. Well, who do you say that I am? And so when we think back into John chapter 1, it was Andrew who said, you know, we found the Messiah. When Nathaniel came and listened to the words of Jesus and he said that you were sitting under the fig tree, he said, oh, that's it. You are the Messiah. You are the Son of God. Um, when we think about um, Matthew's gospel in chapter 14, where Jesus walks on the water, truly this is the Son of God. Um, when we think about the Canaanite woman, you know, you're the Son of God, the King of Israel, you know, you're all these things. So why isn't the confession of faith based on the Canaanite woman or based on the, uh, the confession of Nathaniel or the confession of uh, Andrew? And I think one of the things about it is that there's this human enthusiasm to find the King of Israel, to find the Messiah. Um, and really, when we think about what people were believing about the Messiah at the time, it was really a political kind of a Messiah. Now, certainly not everybody. Uh, you can't say that everybody in, uh, in uh, Judaism and Israel believed in uh, a political messiah, just like you can't say that every Catholic believes in a particular thing or every evangelical believes in a particular thing. Um, but many of them thought that there's the idea of a king who would come in, he would um, establish the kingdom of God here on earth uh, in furtherance of David's kingdom, that he was the true king uh, that would come in, take out the Romans and bring in the, the new kingdom. And so what happens is you see people getting enthusiastic. So Jesus walks in the water. The apostles are all enthusiastic. Um, they have John the Baptist saying that, you know, behold the Lamb of God. And they say, oh, okay, this is the one. But the enthusiasm begins to wane. You know, after a while, enthusiasm, human enthusiasm waxes and wanes. It kind of goes up and it goes down. And so there was that human enthusiasm wasn't there. So he said, well, who do you say that I am? And it's only Peter who says, you are the Christ, uh, the son of the living God. And he says, blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my heavenly father. And I say, you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of the netherworld shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. Whatever you loosed on earth shall be loosed in heaven. One of the things about it is that that uh, city of Caesarea Philippi was built on a bluff. And so it gives that beautiful kind of a visual backdrop of what it means to build on the rock. Um, it also had um, underneath the cave that went down to, to the, they thought, to the pit, to the end of the earth. Um, so the gates of the netherworld there in Caesarea Philippi. Um, it also talks about the keys of the kingdom. And the keys of the kingdom is interesting because it's kind of going back to Isaiah 22. In Isaiah 22, the Lord talks to the prophet and he says that, that Shebna, who's the administrator for the king, um, is not doing his job. And so he's going to take away the keys of the kingdom and give it to Hokiah, and who is going to be the new administrator. And so the keys of the kingdom is to administrate that kingdom. Uh, so too, when we think about Peter, Peter is given the keys of the kingdom. And what does that mean? Um, I think what it doesn't mean is what many of the Protestant reformers would say. Well, you have the visible and the invisible church. The invisible is those true born-again believers. The visible church is the corrupt, human, kind of, um, you know, man-made invention. But instead, what do we see? We see um, Jesus giving Peter the keys of the kingdom. We think about St. Paul, who could have said, well, you know, it really doesn't matter what the church in Corinth is doing, you know, that some people are, are being jealous, some people are, 
you know, are being divisive. Some people are doing all these kinds of things. It really doesn't matter because the message of the gospel is going out and there are people who are coming to faith in Christ. And so it really doesn't matter what these people are doing. No, not at all. Um, St. Paul uh, certainly went after the people who were being divisive. He certainly um, was very forceful in talking about uh, the things that they were doing, that they were not building up a holy community, but fracturing uh, a church. And so by doing that, he goes after them. We think about uh, also in Clement of Rome, when Clement becomes the, uh, the Bishop of Rome, what does he do? He writes to the people of Corinth and says, you know, that basically you need to go back and look at the letters of Paul because you're going right back into your old ways. You're going back right back into the things that you used to do. So again, this idea that somehow God didn't really care about a visible church, that it really doesn't matter, um, really just doesn't line up with Scripture and it doesn't line up with the early church history. Um, but instead, what we see is that Peter was given those keys of the kingdom. And then he's told everyone to tell every, the disciples that he that no one to tell no one that he was the Christ. And one of the things about that is telling no one that he is the Christ is that really, when we think about Jesus' title, uh, Jesus says that in the early in the Gospels that he's the Son of Man. And what does that mean? Well, the Son of Man can be just a representative for the human race. So the prophet Ezekiel is called the Son of Man, but it can also be that something that is um, more messianic. Think about in Daniel, where Daniel has a vision of one like the Son of Man riding on the clouds of heaven. Uh, so, so the Son of Man. So just like in the gospel message, the gospel message initially was, you know, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. What did the gospel message become after Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection? St. Paul said, I'm preaching Christ and Christ crucified. So the, the idea of the Son of Man begins to go away. The idea of the Christ, the Messiah, the one who came to take upon the sins of the world um, by his passion, his death, and resurrection uh, begins to take hold. And so not the political Messiah that maybe they were expecting, but the true Christ, the one who would take away the sins of the world by his passion, his death, and resurrection. Thanks and God bless.